Very hard this time, isn't it? What the? We need to get out of here. Call on the sun to rise, I call on the sun to rise. I call on the sun to rise, I call on the sun to rise. So all in this land may once again move in peace and harmony. Kia ora. Tihi Māori ora. Steps down in the forest. Is that the same as you heard yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Well, what do you think we should do? Should we go over that? Ooh, down here. Here we are, Ashton. Yeah, well, we sort of heard drumming and footsteps in like this sort of direction, and then the dog started barking. And well, that's that's interesting. Let's have a little listen for a minute. Can we hear it now? I can hear a little chainsaw way in the distance. Any drumming? Any dogs barking? No, Hang it's on. gone now. I can only hear a plane. You're right. I wonder if they flew off on the plane. <laughs> you never know what can happen. My personal encounters have always been hearing. Hearing laughter. Hearing music. Hearing little fingers tapping on on the window of a bush hut and wondering what was going on. So all of these things come into play. And I think it's very much the fact that if you do move within nature, you open yourself up to a lot more possibilities. There's perhaps a lot of things going on out there that we're not really aware of. Do you hear that? It's singing. But where's it coming from? It's beautiful, isn't it? It's amazing. I've lost it, though. Can you hear it still? It's gone. Oh, wow. As soon as we had opened our eyes and spoke, the singing stopped. So we thought, well, this must be the other 20 people in our party waiting to, uh, coming down the river to catch up with us. But no, they were still six hours away. We were that far ahead. So that was our first encounter with a voice. Yesterday, I 
had a meeting with um, a friend of mine and he was telling me about a friend of his who lived up near Dargaville and he had some government action going on out the back of his farm. The government had blocked off the whole area and nobody was allowed to go in there. Um, apparently they found some little stone huts, some dwellings, and these guys actually did go into the forest and have a look at them and um, these stones had been carved into. Researcher and documentary producer Annette Reed has come to see me to discuss plans on how we can make contact with the mysterious beings in the forest and investigate claims made by some people of encounters and to look at putting my finds into a documentary. Okay, yeah, I'll just let, get, let me get those coordinates again. Five, seven, six, nine, two, eight, one. That's wonderful. Hey, thanks so much for that. You've really come up with something uh, that we need here. Okay, all the best. We'll see you soon. Bye for now. You wouldn't believe it. What's he You've had? really walked at the right time. The man who's a remote viewer, chap I know in Auckland. So what's a remote viewer? Aha, remote viewing. It's a technique which um, was developed during the Cold War times between um, America and Russia, and they're both working on spy technology, which is utilising people going into a trance-like state and then their mind, somehow or another, from jetting themselves over tens of thousands of kilometres to look down and see what they're supposed to see. Now, this man in Auckland that, uh, that I know has been doing this for a number of years, and I've worked with him before. He has a great degree of accuracy, so he sits in the comfort of his own home. I tell him a rough area, and he will go and have a look. Isn't that amazing? That is, and so he's given us something to go on, has he? Yes, he certainly has. As I move through various parts of the northern landscape in New Zealand, exploring ancient sites where the early comers to this land used to live. When I'd be measuring the distance between stones and looking at distant views, getting the feeling for the place, doing the notes and the photographs and the measurements, I'd often become aware of the fact that I was being looked at. And I'd do the old trick, I'd just try and whip around quickly to see who was there. But there was never anyone there. This human form that we're all in at the moment is a perfectly natural shape, enhanced by the spirit which resides within the human body. But we are, after all, part of the earth. We're part of Papatuanuku, the Mother Earth. We're part of Gaia. And I feel that if we're able to open ourselves to these possibilities when we're within nature, then we'll start to observe ourselves. We'll start to get the feeling. We'll start to hear the messages. We'll start to hear the song. We are developing uh, an awareness and a range of talents that we've hardly touched. And this is becoming more and more common. So without even trying, some people are seeing things that they haven't seen before and feeling things they haven't felt before. And it's rather like what's happening is that we're extending our senses. In 2008, I was driving down the road and next thing, boom, crash. A group of people came flying out of some vegetation beside the road. I had my daughter along the side and we were both quite amazed to see 15 people burst out of these bushes walk in single file very quickly up toward the summit of Tutamoe. Well, one of the things that was remarkable to me was that they were wearing loincloths and the one woman that was with the group of 13 men, one child, was brunette. The rest of them were blonde. Slight wavy curly hair. Sort of like the stuff that you see emblazoned onto the Greek statues. They were a bluey, greeny-eyed people, from what I could see. I stuck my hand out the window, and my head. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The woman had possum skin halter. Um, I stuck my arm out the window, and a big wide arc, and a greeting. The woman, the child, at the end of the group turned. The child looked very apprehensive at first, but then this feeling of 
peacefulness came over his face as they both turned and walked back to the vehicle where myself and my daughter were, still driving along very slowly. And her arm went, right arm went, he got in a big white arc, big smile on her face, the child's face lit up. Everything was all good. I could tell that the men folk that were in up this track knew of my presence, even though no eye contact was made. I noticed that their backs didn't stiffen up, even when the woman and child turned around to come back toward us to have a meeting. With my daughter alongside me in the car, I didn't know what to expect, so I just kept on going, regretfully. I wish I'd have turned around and stopped. Over the years, I've had a number of people share stories with me. It's like, I remember the story the lady told me a few years ago, the time she was tramping on one of the main tracks. And as she moved up the track with her backpack on and her walking stick, she became aware of a sound in the forest alongside her. And she explained to me, it was like children laughing. And she said, I didn't take much notice. I'd only just started on the track. And I assumed that there may have been children around somewhere or something. And away I went, further and further into the forest. She said, that's when I realised that I wasn't dealing with children, I was dealing with something else. I'm often asked, what is the difference between Turehu and Putapaherehi? The names that were used by ancient Māori to describe the forest dwellers. There's no difference in those names. It just depends what iwi um, you come from and what, what to use. Turehu has sometimes been interpreted as many people more with red hair. Patupaerehi describes the fairy folk of the forest who are small in stature, three to four foot tall perhaps, fair of complexion and fair of hair, and their flute playing, the, uh, the, the puturino or the uh, kaiwawa, which are two flutes which are known to Māori of today, and it is believed that they were taught, the Māori were taught the flute making skills by the Potipayarehi. Okay, so that then goes in with the, uh, the stories of them being taught how to, to make fishing nets as well. Oh. Annette and I made plans to bring together a group of fellow researchers to spend the night in a forest where we hope to have a personal encounter. The coordinates given to us by the remote viewer have directed us to a specific forest location. What I've heard is that there have been several attempts to make a documentary about this one by a TV channel, and each one of these attempts was shut down by the Department of Conservation. There has been a degree of sensitivity, but the beauty of it is that a lot of the stories are outside the area of the forest, and so we actually may not, and probably won't be filming in the forest at all. We'll be at other private forestry blocks in which we are permitted access, and so we'll have no trouble. Over the years, there have been many sightings at our suggested research location. Yet when we ask locals to share their stories with us, there seems to be a general reluctance and an air of secrecy. We're doing something which I don't think has ever been done before. What I'm searching for is whether or not these people in the forest, that I like to call them, exist in the physical form. Are they indeed a lost race of people? Are they out there? Have they been living in these forests and parts of New Zealand for all these years? And we haven't stumbled across them, or they haven't stumbled across us? Or are they indeed truly a 
the mystical. stumbled across us? Or are they indeed truly a mystical, mythical fairy folk who exist in another dimension, in another little universe which is parallel to ours? And on occasions we see them and on occasions they see us. I've set off on my journey into the forest. On my way I stop at the workshop of dear friend Kerry Strongman a woodcarver who wishes to give me some offerings that may entice the little people to come and show themselves to us. Hey! Hey, brother! Hey, here. I've got, I've got, I've got something awesome for you. Hey, yeah, I know you're on a special journey, but I've got this really awesome... I've put this whole collection of stuff to assist you. These are treasures that I know that will help you in your journey. It's important that I contribute by giving you as many things. It's important that I contribute by giving you as many things that will bring forth these elusive people. We need to let the world know that they're here, but they will manifest themselves to us and maybe share a little of their great wisdom. As you remember, I spent a lot of time with Aboriginals in Australia, and they were great teachers to me. When I put, when I parted with them to come here, they made me the gift of, of their hair. Aye. And they wove it together in this cord Aye. that we would be all joined. And they wove it together in this cord Aye. that we would be all joined. with Aboriginals in Australia and they were great teachers to me. When I put when I parted with them to come here they made me the gift of, of their hair Aye. and they wove it together in this cord Aye. that we would be all joined. You'll notice that my old white whiskers are in there too. Aye. But I was so humbled when they gave this to me, when the women wove it. All of the tribal people that I was with, it was a small group, and we were doing very sacred journeying with it. But I include this in the treasure box because they taught me a lot of what I know about spiritual things, and I'm very grateful to them, and I think it's really important that they journey with us. So there's the box to put that in. It's like all indigenous people, I'm sure they're musical. This is a spirit whistle. So if we can't communicate at one level, maybe you'll be able to communicate at another level. There's a little story with this, a tragic story. A female come ashore to die. And after she died, they noticed that her tummy was moving. 
and inside it was another young female. Um, we were unable to, even though we birthed the young one, we were unable to save it. But to show that there's innocence, to show that there is truth and, and that things are sacred, this is the jawbone of something that never got to be born. But may it walk on into the future, bringing peace for all of the people. Safe voyage, my friend. May you hear without your ears and see without your eyes and speak without your mouth that the little people can hear you. God bless. As I continue my journey, I get the news that due to cultural sensitivity, the Department of Conservation has turned down our request to film in one of our chosen forests. This means then that all of our filming will have to be done on private land. I got up one evening, I saw a flash of movement at the window. I saw the tail end of the white hair disappearing in three different directions. But there was a woman left there. I'm not sure whether her face and hair were covered in mud or soot or whatever, but she stayed there. She knew that she wasn't as visible as her offsiders. She stayed there, looking, listening, taking all of what was going in, and made the eye contact several times. And through that eye contact, we both realised there was nothing to worry about and there was this great uplifting feeling. And we've got nothing to fear from these people, but they've got everything to fear from us. We hold fear. We bring fear in the, uh, in the DNA. Fear coming from our past and from our ancient past. Fear which says, if we speak our truth, if we trust our own feeling and share it with others and they don't accept it, we're in danger. We can be threatened. We have a whole long history in the Dark Ages of being tortured, maimed, killed in the most horrendous way for speaking our truth. The message that I get as I walk through is that they're waiting for us. I'm getting this funny feeling behind me again. Is there something behind us, Gordon, or, or not? There is. The three of them behind us. Three? Three. Oh, once again, I get shivers up and down my back when you tell me that. So I don't worry. <laughs> you don't worry? It doesn't worry me. Uh, They've come up to a point where they can now watch and see everyone. They can actually see us? Yes. We're not likely to see them? No. They're very careful. Oh, I mean, well, how do they appear and disappear? How? It's uh, a very superior bushcraft. Ah. And this is why the Maori were so afraid of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time they normally would be seen would be when they're surprised. Because I also suspect that some of them are shape changers. Wow. So, in other words, they can just blend in the forest background or yes. whatever is available. And you won't see them. That's great. So no wonder they're still with us. And they're still here. They've survived. That's correct. So 
this comes to you sort of quite naturally, Gordon. You, yes. You've sort well, of experienced this quite a lot over the years, haven't you? Yes, yeah. but as the years go on, I get more sensitive to this sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to uh, relate way back when I was between the ages of three and eight. My name, my family name was Parahe. Parahe is a name shortened for Patupai Arahe. In my household, there, uh, there was about um, 13 of us children. When the first mist came with the winter, the voices would call about two or three in the morning. Yet when they called to come to play, apparently I was the only one who would answer their call. All the rest slept on. My mum would hear me get up. She thought I was just going to the toilet, but she'd never hear me come back in. And this went on for years upon year, you know, as the years went by. I'd go and play with them, they'd come out. The smaller children would be there waiting, waiting for me. Come on, come on. But yet, they never spoke to me with their mouth. Everything was done through the mind. We could understand each other, yet we never met each other. Yeah. They would take me, and they would take me down to meet the rest of their family with the older people of their family. And we'd go down, and we'd meet them, and they'd all laugh, and they'd run, and jump, and spin. And if, you know, life to them was fun. It was all it was fun. But as soon as that first rays of the sun came, they would say to me, we have to go. We have to go now. We have to go. You come with us. I said, no. I have to go home to my family. So I'd go home, run home, as if it was affecting me. But it didn't affect me, the sun. But it affected them. They had to be back hiding before their son came. Now that went on till I was at the age of nearly eight and one morning I come tearing home and my mum was sitting out on the veranda waiting. She said to me, hey boy, where have you been? I said, oh, I've been playing with my friends. What friends? All your mates are all asleep. I said, yeah, mum, I've got another family of friends. You haven't been with those patapai in there. And I said, yes, I've how long have you been playing with them? I said, for years. And how do they contact you? They would come to me every morning to go and play, to uh, learn to dance with them, learn to jump and circle with them. Some of them could do two or three somersaults before they hit the ground. Oh. Me, I could never get one complete somersault. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to laugh at me. They all laughed at me, but I still tried. <laughs> Anyhow... When mum found I was doing that, she said to me, I have to take you down to see my dad. So she'd take me down to see her uh, father and her father would look at me and he'd say to me, Boy, did those Patupaita here ever take you past those springs? I said, no, granddad. As soon as I got to those springs, they used to say to me, come on, keep going, we're going home. I said, no, I have to go home. 
and you'd say to my mum and dad, now this boy knows he's not to go past those springs with them. He knows where his boundaries are, so he's overrun. When he gets to eight, I was nearly eight then. He's taller than most of them in the whanau of this particular band, and they won't come and get him anymore. When I turned eight, the next time around, just before Christmas, and the, the next winter came, and I heard them, and I'm up, ready to go and play. Raced outside, but they didn't come to my place anymore. But I could hear them playing in the, in the mist. Now, that's why I kept asking you, is the mist down now? Because the moment the mist is there, they are in the mist. They want people to realize that they are no longer hidden. They are no longer a danger to us. But they are a small part of our community that should have been recognized years and years ago. We hear amongst Māori them that term of kaitiakitanga. In English terms, guardianship. And a lot of us believe that's our law. Which it is, but it's not solely our law. Those little people we refer to are kaitiaki also. In the past, the humans and those little people worked together to maintain the kaitiaki tongue. What's been lost over, over a number of generations is the unity between the human race that we know as humans and those little people. And this is what they've been waiting for, the re-establishment of the relationship between ourselves and them. And I'm hearing that coming from this table tonight. And that really warms my heart. something I was getting that's probably a bit controversial actually. <laughs> I was I was like, yeah, I was I was like watching it but uh those little people have been used as food. Yeah. That's why they're not so fast to uh materialise in solid form in this in this yeah. layer. They have the validity to. Um performing monkey comes to mind, uh yeah. circus act, you know, that kind of it. And and if they didn't, you know, it was a case of like it was the, it's not so much like cannibalism, but more of a vampirish of energy. Does that make sense? Is it, it's like it, the energy. Yeah, the energy, energy, yeah. Tenakwe, Tenakwe, Tenakwe. Kinga 
mai te rangi ki te whenua e. Mihi aroha, mihi aroha. It is 10 to 1 in the morning. The team and I are setting up our cameras and listening posts ready to film whatever may occur in and around the forest area. Is everyone standing still? Pretty daunting sitting here in the dark. It's a beautiful night. The forest is still. I haven't really seen anything yet. I wonder if uh, the beings are actually dimensional and not as physical. shape that isn't it yeah. it's, it's almost like a square but it's definitely something on the left hand side of us so <laughs> i'm hearing something sort of over in this direction but it's just almost like a rustling on the uh, forest floor amongst the dried leaves Occasionally a clicking sound. I thought I uh, heard earlier before uh, some other really faint singing to me from deep in the forest. It's like the wind mixed with sound. It was interesting. Uh, it's There's a clicking sound again. So what's the knocking? It is these sticks. It is the way that they uh, communicate if they do not want to uh, um, speak, so to speak. But they also do this to communicate with humanity. We're here. We are in. Sitting in the forest. Must be just after four o'clock in the morning. Let's see if we can pick up any fairy folk. Often they uh, are seen just before dawn. I've just got the feeling that I'm being observed. There's a some movement out there, but I can't make it out. It's it's quite indistinct. Do you know in proximity how far the fairy folk are back from us at the moment? Like how many meters? Oh, we're about fifty to seventy meters away, but very far. You hear it? I heard that. But there we go again. the king sound.
Our weekend of exploration has come to an end. Beautiful moments and stories have been shared. And yet I feel a hint of disappointment about not having had an actual encounter with the Patabayari or the fairy folk. But the tables are quickly turned after I receive a phone call from the film's director. She has requested I make my way to Auckland immediately because she has spotted a strange anomaly while viewing our footage. Yes, I wouldn't normally get you to come over all the way to Auckland if it wasn't for something really important. Well, I knew it would be for something quite special, mm. yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Are you ready to have a look? Oh, I can't wait. Yeah? Let us go. So, obviously, the reenactment bit and shot mm. that we didn't use. Right. And I've marked a, a circle. Oh, my gosh. What's that? I, I saw it straight away when I was um, oh, have uploading the footage. Okay. Okay, and watch the zoom in, Gary. That's a lot more detail. You see that? Oh, my There's a little slow mo. Yeah. Wow, well, well, what on earth is that? So basically, what do you think? <laughs> what can I think? I mean, this is just amazing. And the fact we set out to find something, and we have, what it is, I mean, I, I, I can't really say. At this stage, we've got to have a closer look at this, but this is just amazing. It's not an animal, it's not people, there are no people there. Yeah, so if it's not human, then it's not an animal. Oh, what have we got? And what is it? What is it indeed? What is it indeed? Uh, I've been looking at footage in New Zealand for about 30 years now, photographs and footage of, of anomalous things and anomalous objects. And I certainly think that this piece of footage is unusual. It looks to me to be too bright to be sunlight reflecting off um, leaves, the, the patches of light are too big and too bright. They appear to intensify in certain parts of the footage, um, almost to the point of glowing. Um, there appear to be several objects or figures, that some closer to the foreground, some behind, moving not in unison, moving in random fashion. We know that the brain and the eye can trick us into believing we're seeing what we want to believe is there. So I can't categorically state what it is. But there is one point in the footage where, to me, um, there is quite clearly a rotation of something that appears to be a large white head. We see a patch of light uh, side view, and it appears to be an object, and then we quite clearly see that object rotate. So that tells me that we're not necessarily just looking at sunlight reflecting off leaves in the forest. We're looking at something that's actually in there behind the trees moving. I would suggest that the footage be sent to a professional photographic data analyst um, to have a closer look at it and uh, run it through the programs and see if they're able to um, ascertain any further details that might be useful. But it certainly is uh, anomalous given the bush environment that this uh, footage was taken in. It doesn't fit. It's a very interesting capture indeed. The humanoid to me is looks very, it's very small for one thing, and the body is just proportionally smaller than the head. The head is not, it's not bulbous, but it kind of almost looks kind of blockheaded. This is what I call a watcher. A very close friend of mine who is also a photo analyst has been researching along the Sasquatch for about 30 years and he found one in New Zealand. Matter of fact, it seems like he found more than one, but one really excellent uh, shot that is, there's, it's undeniable. Now, what I think is going on here is that there's a symbiotic relationship between the Sasquatch and the Watchers. 
The watchers, of course, are looking out for the Sasquatch, uh, warning them of any, any impending danger, <clears throat> and the Sasquatch are, are the protectors. It's, it's possible, probable, based on the research I've done, that these creatures are inter interdimensional, but they're becoming less so at this time, and more of them are being seen. To our amazement, psychic Dowser Gordon had picked up on the whereabouts of the beings about 15 minutes after the recording of the anomalous footage. You're looking over your shoulder. What's behind us, Gordon? Oh, there's someone back there. Back there? There's someone back there now. Yeah, so I'll, I'll do distance on the one behind us now. About 52 metres. 52 metres. I'd be very surprised if we even saw them today. Uh... In order to be successful in life, in our society as we have constructed, it, you have to fit in. You have to have a set of beliefs uh, th that are acceptable. And the beliefs that are primarily acceptable are things that can be shown and proved and other people can see for their own eyes. As I arrive home, another unexpected surprise awaits me. Dear Mr. Cook, I've heard that you're looking for information on the fairy folk or the Patupai Arahi. I have enclosed photographs of small skulls. Measurements have shown that these small skulls are indeed mature adult beings. As you may be well aware, due to cultural sensitivity, it is not permitted in New Zealand to handle human bones or send them for radiocarbon dating or DNA. I hope that this information will help you in your invaluable research. Kind regards, a supporter. I'm feeling grateful for the answers I've been given during this quest. Yet I'm also amazed at how in this day and age, there's still so much secrecy around subjects that should be transparent. For it is my belief that the truth will set all creatures free, both humans and other beings. So my journey continues. This is not the last you've heard from me or from them.